Hey everyone, the name is Eric Dorr and today's video is on INFJ consciousness. And I would like to say first, thank you, thank you to all my Patreon supporters. Guess what? We just got to the next level. We got HD equipment. We are ready to take the next step in making better and better videos. And making a bigger difference to the overall MBTI and psychology communities. I want to talk about INFJ consciousness. I want to talk about how an INFJ experiences the world. And I will tell you something. Did you know your conscious experience, your cognitive functions, can be seen in how you gesture? Because how you gesture contains the secret to how you see information, how you think, how you process information, how you deal with and handle and operate on your thoughts and emotions. The first thing I want to make you aware of is an INFJ's flow consciousness, the INFJ's healthy mindset, how the INFJ sees the world when healthy. And then I want to contrast that against how the INFJ sees the world when under stress, when in a crisis situation. And the first thing I would like to talk about is the INFJ simulator and worldview. When the INFJ grabs for and reaches for their truth, how we see the world, how we envision the world, how we want the world to be, often what we tend to do is we tend to make a kind of pull, a gentle pull with our wrists as we grab for something from the inside and pull it outwards. Fingers relaxed, wrists relaxed, we pull for information carefully. We are not precise. The INFJ is not about grabbing for specific facts or specific data. We are not about precision. We're not about that exact thought or that exact statement or that exact way of operating on truth. We're not about that exact form of logic versus that. We're not about grabbing for statement A or statement B. We deal with nuance and we deal with prediction. INFJs live and carry out their healthy life from a form of simulator from a form of virtual reality, a reconstruction of reality, a theoretical model, but without logic, without lines. Imagine the inner world of an INFJ, and the inner world of an INFJ is like a fantasy landscape. It is like a movie from Lord of the Rings. It is about the map of mountains and rivers and landscapes and nature and trees and animals and living things. And there is no rule in this altered reality. There is no logical operation. There is no fact. There is no statistic. There is no lines. There is just angular and curved and chaotic, but only seemingly chaotic thoughts. Through this, this INFJ landscape operates according to a form of natural symmetry. As you start looking out and exploring this landscape of the INFJ, you notice that while the rules are hard to grasp and often unclear, there is a form of system behind it. There is some kind of symmetry, some kind of discipline to the INFJ's thoughts to the INFJ's mindset. The INFJ has tremendous mental discipline and self-focus. And there is a strong desire for the INFJ to constantly synthesize on and blend this world. There is grammar to how the INFJ thinks. There is structure to the INFJ's mind. There is rules to guide the INFJ's thought process. 
So if you begin to ask the INFJ why they placed the trees where they did, why they put the animals how they did, and why things happened, INFJs always have an explanation. They might look like it is pure chaos, but there is always an explanation to every single move the INFJ makes. And the INFJ has a pursuit. The INFJ is pursuing the purest essence, the purest representation of thought, the purest representation of tree, the purest representation of woman or man, the purest archetype, the purest idea, the purest mental conception of an object or a thought. And the INFJ is highly idealistic in the pursuit of this thought. They pursue that perfect word, that perfect sentence, that perfect statement, that perfect way to look at a thought or an idea. The INFJ practices perfectionistic ideals inside their own mind, while their living room can look like it's haven't been cleaned in weeks or months. Yes, it's not just a stereotype that INFJs have the messiest living rooms of all the personality types. And it is hard to believe then that the INFJ's mind can be so rigor rigorous, so disciplined, that the INFJ's thoughts can be so formal, so structured, so judging. And I want to talk about something in particular. INFJs as storytellers, because an idea does not want to stay inside your own head. Ideas want to be shared. Ideas have a way of wanting to kind of pop out of your head. So INFJs often make great storytellers. INFJs often make a gesture like this, gesturing with their palms facing towards their audience, moving their hands in a spiral-like pattern with relaxed palms and once again relaxed fingers. The INFJ is trying to give you an idea, put an idea inside your head, put what they see and share it with you so that you can see the same thing. And our wrists are relaxed, our movements are relaxed, our fingers are relaxed because we do not want to <laughs> wake you up. We're not trying to make you shake, shake you up. We're not trying to make you look at the world around you. We're not trying to give you adrenaline. We're trying to make you relax. Calm down your mind. Calm down your senses so that you can see something bigger than present reality. INFJs are consciously trying to manifest their consciousness and share it with the world, making other people see what it is they see. And I want to talk about why the INFJ's fingers are relaxed as they gesture towards you. It is because in part we want you to relax around us. We want you to show we want to show you that we don't mean any harm. We're not trying to boss you around. We're not trying to give orders. We're not trying to tell you exactly what to do or how or when. We're trying to steer, manage, and guide. INFJs are excellent guides of people. Guides that give subtle ideas and thoughts and perspectives that you can use to do whatever the hell you want with. We don't give and we don't deal with objective orders or straightforward tips. We deal with more nuanced truths, more nuanced perspectives that have that require some interpretation, some personal interpretation. Now note that this is the INFJ at best. The INFJ that can run a simulation and see a better world, see an ideal world, and an INFJ that can convey and share this idea with other people, sharing and making other people aware of this greater reality. 
Now imagine the INFJ under stress. And you saw him recently. You saw him in my video, I'm not sure anymore. Then I was in the grip of sensing and perceiving. I got restless. I got jacked up on adrenaline. I got overwhelmed with all the duties and expectations I had on myself. I got restless in the sense that I wanted to rush to the answer that often for the INFJ takes a long time. The INFJ simulation process is not a race from 0 to 100 in 2 seconds. The INFJ process takes time and the INFJ process cannot be rushed. But the INFJ under stress and anxiety can feel tempted to want to rush it. But tendentially, truth that is rushed is false. Imagine the unhealthy or stressed INFJ simulator as under attack by, and I will show this with this grabbing swift motion, sudden unanticipated events. Imagine INFJ caught off guard by constant new events, hard, firm, precise things that often go directly against how the INFJ wishes to see or think. Under stress, as an INFJ, it can feel like you are in a race car moving too fast. You're experiencing inner turmoil and it can feel like often reality is kind of shouting at you. You feel as an INFJ under stress like people are shouting at you with megaphones, like there are people demanding your attention, like there are things around you constantly demanding your focus. You can feel like there are things on your shoulders, burdens, heavy objects, heavy metal objects that are burdening you, pressuring you down. You can feel as an INFJ under stress, as if constant things are constantly grabbing at you. There are people demanding your attention, there are things around you that is constantly shaking you up, breaking you out of this ideal dreamer state. INFJs have a difficult relationship with adrenaline. Of course we can love adrenaline. Who, can, who doesn't love adrenaline? At the same time, adrenaline can get a grip of us. It can make us start looking around us, start feeling restless, start constantly uh, feeling like we are juggling with things that are coming towards us, tennis balls coming at us from everywhere that we have to stop. This is the worst thing that can happen to an INFJ. Like I said, INFJ reality, mental landscape, can have quite a bit of rain. It can have rain because it loves the smell of petrichor, the sound of that rain makes when it stops raining. The INFJ can love a part of melancholy, a part of darkness, a part of the more troublesome and difficult things. The INFJ is comfortable with a little sadness, with a little grief. But the INFJ can feel, and this is the primary burden of an INFJ, that they have to act tough, happy, enthusiastic, just for the sake of other people. They may feel like they have to be roses and sunshine and status and desirable at all times. And the final part of INFJ consciousness is what you do when you feel weak. As an INFJ. As an INFJ, you have a tendency to operate on and analyze yourself as if you were a machine. You have a tendency to go into this machine mode where you start thinking of yourself purely as a question of numbers and figures. You have the ability to imagine ideas and ideals, but when you look at and analyze yourself, you have a tendency to be too cold. You have a tendency to look at yourself 
purely mathematically, purely in relation of scores and balance, purely, purely from the perspective of how good you are from a mechanical point of view. Perhaps one of the most difficult parts of INFJ consciousness is that experience of hardcore self-analysis, harsh self-analysis, where you deconstruct yourself, where you break down yourself into pieces and puzzle pieces, into questions of science and logic, instead of empathizing with yourself, empathizing with who you are, understanding yourself and why you made the decisions you made, understanding why you took the action you took. As an INFJ, don't be too harsh on yourself. Focus on your story. Focus on your future and your ideal. Don't spend too much time in that break uh, lab environment. Don't dissect yourself as if you were a machine. But treat yourself as if you were a human. So as an INFJ, what I can encourage you to do is recognize race car mentality. Recognize when you are rushing yourself to something that needs time. As an INFJ, recognize machine mentality. Recognize when you are talking to yourself or analyzing yourself as if you were a machine. As an INFJ, recognize megaphone syndrome. Recognize when the world is overwhelming you and when all the noises and chaos around you is getting too much for you. And as an INFJ, recognize when your reality is overly optimistic. When you are trying too hard to make everything seem like roses and rainbows, even though for you, it should be okay to have a little rain. As an INFJ, redirect to flow consciousness by entering into your inner world. Write your own rules. Write your own story. Imagine your own inner mental landscape. All the flowers, all the trees, the sky, the rain, the textures, the people, the animals, the stories. And as an INFJ, move and reorient towards storytelling. Perhaps if you're an INFJ artist, make an experiment. Draw up your inner consciousness at its best and at its worst. Or as an INFJ writer, write about what your consciousness is like. Or talk about it with one of your friends or family. Or make a video on YouTube. Find your style of expression. And find trust in uh, your own personal mental landscape, no matter how it may look. That's all for today. There will be no video tomorrow. But stay frosty, everyone. And I hope to see you guys in the next video.